expert in information systems at AUT University. So Vanessa and I are going to facilitate the session this afternoon. Great. Um, so workplace digital literacy, in case you thought you got into the wrong session, you might want to leave. Um, so we thought we'd just talk about the future of workplaces and what it is that we might need to be thinking about. So we want to take this session into perhaps a more futuristic focus, um, but we'd be keen to understand what everyone here might want to talk about and learn about. So um, there's a sort of update for the, for the session. I'm not going to read it out. But Antonio and I have thought about sort of three key topics, issues, ideas that we thought we'd just share a few stories about um, that we can contribute to and then throw it out to the floor um, to see who else might want to think about digital workplace literacy skills. So first po uh, well, possible topics. Uh, we've got as over-reliance on technology, organisational process adapting to technology and the move to mobile is a good start. Uh, so we thought, um, we've been talking about Antonio and I around the over-reliance of technology in workplaces and Antonio, you've got a, a, mm -hmm. a story around this and we thought if we can try and keep it perhaps story related, example related um, and we'll throw out the floor to see if anyone else wants to contribute. Yes, uh, let me give you some background about this story. I'm conducting research on the use of information technology by visually impaired workers. And one of my participants is a cook, not even a chef, a cook. He works in the kitchen. And he has a serious uh, visual impairment. And he heavily relies on his iPad, a tablet, to do his work. So he checks the recipes on his iPad. He, he needs to blow the recipes up in order to read the, the, the ingredients and instructions. Uh, he needs to record temperatures of the fridge because of uh, health and safety regulations. And for everything, he uses the iPad. For example, if he needs to check the temperature, he takes a photo of the, of the display where the temperature is on the fridge. And then he blows, up, uh, he blows, uh, blows it up on his iPad. And then he records it digitally. He places orders using his iPad. When he needs to go to the storeroom to check the ingredients, he goes and takes photos of the ingredients and then he uses his iPad to check that the ingredients are the ones that he needs for, 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 for his work. So this is an example of over-reliance of technology, which may sound contradictory to the topic that we are going to discuss today because we are talking about digital skills in the workplace. And when we think about digital skills in the workplace, it comes to our mind about the lack of digital skills. But in this case, and many others that I have seen in, in my research, it is not the lack of digital skills. They are highly competent in the use of, of technology. So this is one example, one story, and then we can continue the discussion on this if, if you want, if you are interested in this. Yeah. So does anyone want to contribute to something there? Hi, I'm Tracy Morgan. I work at the University of Waikato, um, and I'm the digital literacy advisor there. And um, one of the things that strikes me is it's not so much about an overuse of technology, but appropriate use of technology. You know, um, yeah. So uh, for for what it's worth, I th I think that um, for that man, it's probably not too much. Actually, it's probably perfect, perfect amount of technology in his workplace, because he needs it, right, to do his job. Uh -huh. But um, yeah, I, I don't. I don't know about an over reliance on it. Um, I, I'd like to know what you mean by over reliance. Is is that bad, or was uh, the implica Im implication that that's a bad thing? Yeah. Well, I, I don't. Maybe over reliance is not the best term. It is just a term that we were discussing before having this session. I'm still trying to develop the, or to find the right words to describe this. And it is not the only case. Uh, well, there are some trust 2020 people here, and I conducted research with uh, refugees, refugee communities in New Zealand. And something that I discovered is that they use technology, I mean email, in this case is email, uh, to hide their vulnerabilities because they may not feel confident in the use of English language. So they prefer to receive information by email. For example, if we have a phone conversation and you say, okay, we are going to meet up this Sunday at this place at this time. I want to make sure that I got the, the right message. So I said, do you mind sending me an email with information? And that is for work-related purposes. So again, is it over-reliance? 
I don't know if it is over-reliance with a negative connotation, but it is reliance on technology to, for, uh, for fulfilling specific needs. Mm -hmm. I don't know if there are other questions or comments. Yeah. Anyone else want to contribute? Um, I think we have touched about, upon this a while and it, uh, a lot <laughs> in, in NetHui so far. And I, d I don't know if it's over-reliance or it's the assumption that the technology is available. And that's obviously something 2020 Trust work a lot on um, not having that assumption but I think when we're talking about workplace digital literacy and I'm seeing this um, my my experience with the 2020 trust is I'm about to start the ICDL the international computer drivers license at my workplace um, yeah <laughs> well having said that, I signed up six months ago I'm, I'm, I'll get there um, <laughs> but uh, the whole reason being is that people assume um, coming into a workplace that you have a base level of knowledge and if you do not have that base level of knowledge you cannot do your job and um, this is actually a bigger problem in our workplace than any others because we have a, a rotating um, internship program where they're quite young and then again you assume because they're young they know what they're doing and that may or may not be the case so we're doing something like ICDL to build that base you can be better than it but at least you are it I don't know if that makes sense <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we might move on just to some of the other ideas that we've been thinking about. Um, so organisational processes adapting to technology. So this is kind of a concept around uh, an organisation does X, Y, Z to get their business done and by adding technology that might mean that the Y in the X, Y, Z changes. So I think, Antonio, you've got um, police story. Yeah. Yes, I got another example. Uh, I call it the Digital Mobility Research Group at the UT, and I have one colleague who is doing research with the police force in New Zealand. And you may know that the police force or police officers were given iPhones and iPads. And again, uh, so far he found that there is not a lack of literacy, but they, many of them find incompatible the use of technology for the work that they do. So they see that they, they find technology to be an a strange element, a strange device for the, the, the execution of their work activities. So maybe this is how we accommodate or how we modify work practices when we introduce technology. Do we need technology in the first place? Maybe that's the question. I don't have the answer. Hi, my name is Louise and I work for Auckland Libraries and I'm sponsoring um, a project at Auckland Libraries at the moment called Digital DNA. And what this project team um, have been looking at is how do we make sure that that digital stuff is integrated into everything that we do and is never treated as something separate. Um, libraries can't exist without technology. The, the technology, the digital stuff is, um, adds a whole lot of choice to our customers and about how they connect with us, how they connect with other people and it's absolutely crucial. But what the project team are coming to is that to be a, digital, uh, a digitally mature organisation and it's not just about training, it's not just about having your staff with all the digital skills, which we also need because they're, they're helping our communities get those digital skills as well. But in fact, you need to make sure that everything you do around service design, product design, um, has a digital element uh, and that it is agile, that you don't try and predict what's happening in the future. You need to make sure that your, your processes and your policies are <coughs> agile and uh, flexible and adapt to the changes that are going to be coming at us because it's such a constantly changing world. So a digital organisation is one that uses um, customer-centric design principles, that uh, tries to be adaptive and use prototype to experiment, innovate, fail, and learn from that. Uh, one of the things that we've found is that we've got plenty of technology at the university. We've got tons of it. It's stacks, just for everything you could want. But one of, um, in terms of organisational process, what we're doing is we're replicating um, business process and just adding 
digital on top of it. So instead of actually looking at the business process and examining what it is that we want to achieve and then applying the best technology to get that outcome, we're just basically going, oh, we'll digitise it, which you know I think is ineffective. And so what we've tried to do is um, contextualise digital literacy. So working with groups, sitting down and trying to unpack what it is that's needed for a particular process. So it's not, I don't think there's one size fits all. I think it is very, very contextual. And depending on the process, depending on the people, depending on the outcome, will um, sort of, will, it will become clear what it is that's needed in that space and which technology is going to match. Um, I mean, I, I do think that there needs to be some sort of baseline, but I think, you know, on top of that, it does become, um, for it to be transformational, it needs to be contextual as well. Uh, hi, Lawrence Wimfer, I'm with the 2020 Trust. Um, I think one of the biggest examples of this is actually in the school sector, um, workplace of teachers in schools, where the technology has got out of alignment with where the teachers are. So the, the, with this huge um, shift to bring your own device, um, kids coming in with their own devices, managing that, um, we do a biannual survey um, of technology in schools, and last year it revealed that actually the teacher confidence in, in using technology for learning had gone down for the first time since we started tracking this in 1992 it has been a steadily increase and then in the last two years it's dropping and we're attributing it to this growth of the BYOD device so here's the technology being introduced at a faster rate than the professionals uh, the teachers that can deal with and uh, I'm interested whether universities and others have actually got that same space and the you know, same issue in the education space where the technology is just going too fast um, and our people processes and organisational processes, professional development, all that stuff just can't keep up. Oh, oh thanks. Um, I just, from what Tracy said, the thing that interests, interests me is exactly that, that if you look at the literacy, it's no point just bolting it on on the top. And so I think you have to, especially for businesses, they have to look at an idea now with the digital lens and start right at the beginning saying, let's assess this idea, how are we going to implement this, knowing now that technology all exists. And then while I've got the floor, <laughs> I have found this website, the British government site, that goes through this in a step-by-step -step logical way starts with assessing the idea, looking at a lean on a business model canvas, you know, the context of agile, all that kind of thing. So it takes um, any idea and it works you through eight different courses to look at it, how would how you get to a um, business result that's digital. And then when you know what, you, what the goal and if you're going to achieve and improve your business or your university or your school, whatever, then you'll get the people with the skills you need. So you're not doing it from that side, you're doing it from the you know the top down of the business into the, then you'll work out what skills you need and um, URL, really sure, <laughs> it's um, Digital Business Academy UK dot com, and uh, I don't know if you heard me say it, the other thing, but I'm working with the government to um, get this into New Zealand as a white label with a February 2016 launch. If I get everyone over the line. Um, so we can start using this thing immediately because we get, the Brits took two years to figure this out with Cambridge Uni and the government and blah, 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 blah. They've already done it and we can actually just straight out use it and you could all apply it to any organisation you were with right now. Um, in fact, you can use it immediately with the British Postal Code. You don't even have to wait till I try and get the Is New Zealand. Over there. Um, it's, no, right now, if you have a British postal code, just jump on. I use number 10 Downing Street. I find out what that is. But <laughs> it's one I can't remember. It's like Beverly Hills 9120. You know. um, yeah, so I just put in a British postal code and you can start using it right now. But the thing that's interesting is um, how the work in New Zealand is we'll have partners um, that have rewards and meetups and things locally. So it's not just online that no one does. You need a meet-up localised structure or you, or you don't do the work. So it's got a really smart model. So have, have a look at it. I mean, I haven't quite got there, but I'm getting damn close. So um, hopefully next year I'll be here saying it's all, all done and dusted. So, yeah. Yeah. 
Why don't you go first? I already had my turns. Hi, I'm Rob from uh, the National Library, um, and I run the Any Question service, which is an online service for New Zealand school students, which we aim to develop their digital literacy skills and information literacy and all that. Um, one of the projects that we're in the process of scoping at the moment is some targeted sessions with schools and um, isolate, uh, basically high priority needs kind of areas and stuff like that, where uh, it, through the sessions we're going to look to develop um, teacher skills alongside student skills and kind of do the teacher side of things by stealth. Um, because teachers, when you talk to them, well, I know what I'm doing, but they don't necessarily know. So, um, yeah, so it's just something that we're, we're in the process of developing to kind of help address that stuff. Um, so, yeah. I know one of the issues that we've had has been motivation, and um, was it Lawrence? Hey, um, oh, yeah, we, we talked online. Um, so uh, nice to meet you. Um, uh, one of the problems we have is, is motivation because you know um, we do have lots of BYD, um, but we don't care because you know what we give students is what we give them, and they take it because that's what we're giving them. You know, we'll stand up for 50 minutes and talk at them, and that's our pedagogy. So for me, the hardest part is to actually problem solve a different way of engaging. Um, you know, because I, I guess it's a it's really hard to change practice and for me it all really comes down to we're all awesome problem solvers and technology isn't really the issue. We all know that we solve problems every single day and tech is just another problem to solve or getting your head around tech and how to use tech is just another problem. But if for us to solve problems we have to care about them and so for me it's about culture change and getting people to care about the problem. And because, you know, we've, as I say, we've got tons of tech. Tech's coming out our ears. They just have to put up their hand and we'll run at them and show them how to use something. But um, they, they don't want to. <laughs> um, and I think that's probably true in, in a lot of spaces because what we're doing is working okay. You know, it works okay. We get results, but it's not the best we could do. But um, it's, it's getting that um, engagement and drive and motivation ex somehow. I'd like to know some answers if anybody's got any. So, yeah, so I would like to share my own experience uh, working in a big organization. So technology is being introduced very fast. So every second month or third month, you will see something new. Some new software coming, so some new software to manage digital contents. Um, so all those kind of things. So technology is being introduced very fast. But at the same time, uh, there's not um, good literacy uh, training systems there, so it's mostly information session. Okay, so we are introducing this thing, you can do this, 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 this with this software, and it ends up that people, a lot of people don't even bother to use a lot of functionalities you are providing in all those new systems. So I, from my personal point of view, there is lack of literacy, lack of proper training for the people in some of the big organizations. You're introducing technology, but at the same time, you're not educating people enough to get the full potential from the technology. Hi, I'm Martin Danner. I'm a recovering American and a permanent Kiwi. And uh, I, I agree with the, your, your assessment that uh, it's hard to get people to care about this stuff. <clears throat> we work with uh, SMEs quite a bit, a uh, managed IT service company. And uh, it seems that uh, the, the issue here is one of lack of immediacy. You know, I mean, these poor people, they're overworked. And you know they're they're struggling with well how am I going to make the next payroll you know how how are we going to uh, increase sales here and technology is just sort of the last thing on their mind um, so I guess it becomes one of well okay how do you how do you create a sense of urgency around this stuff and it's it's not the technology is not a problem it's an enabler but they need to see it in terms of how is it going to solve my immediate problem. You know, how can we use this technology to reduce costs, to find better employees, to increase sales, to reduce risk? You know, if we can couch it in those terms, then you start getting their attention. Thank you for the contribution. Just, just building on that um, and the other motivator for us, because um, librarians are very passionate about the communities they work with. So um, if, if, you, 
if if the story is uh, your use of technology is going to be a, make a better experience for our customers. That's something that strongly motivates them. And and the other thing we talk about is um, doing away with the idea of the digital fairy who's going to come along and rescue everyone. Everybody has to take ownership. Hi, I'm um, Joe Sotman from the Innovation Partnership here. I just wanted to um, kind of tell Tucker what just got said about um, not talking about technology to small businesses. Small businesses could not be less interested and making a technology technology a part of what they do. They don't care about using the internet. It's not of interest to them at all. If you are in the business or at all interested in helping a small business, you need to identify the pain point that you're solving. You, we're here to help you be more productive. We're here to help you be more efficient. We're here to help you save money. Oh great, how are you going to do that? With this awesome tool that I've got called the internet or called the cloud. Um, the technology is the th has to be the thing that comes last in that conversation. Um, or you're not going to take them with them. Oh, do you want to, sorry, just next door to you. Hi, Brittany Travers from the Tertiary Education Commission. So I'll just do a sh shout out to one of our funds, WPL, Workplace Literacy Fund. And we've got a website that we're redesigning called skillshighway.gov.nz, um, which is basically selling this idea of the benefits of training up staff in digital literacy in the workforce, and particularly in New Zealand. So there's over one million New Zealanders with fundamental issues in, in uh, literacy, reading, writing, maths, and f um, flowing from that digital literacy. And so um, definitely like we're looking at how we can um, talk to businesses about how we can solve their their problems, particularly small businesses who um, can't often afford a lot of release time for for their employees, particularly in the construction industry um, here in in South Auckland, where it's it's really difficult to find time um, for these employees to train. And so, what's happening in the um, early mornings? Um, providers are coming in and the results have been amazing. So these people are going on to achieve um, unit standards on the NZQA framework. Um, and so, yeah, it's going to be an ongoing challenge to get buy-in from businesses, but um, yeah, definitely selling it from a business perspective is really important. Well, that topic had a few comments. Uh, the third one that we were thinking of was just the move to mobile and I guess this is probably more of a futuristic look at digital workplaces or workplaces moving to digital. What will they look like in say 20, 30 years time? Um, will that mean a, a, a greater move to mobile? Will it mean going backwards? Anyone want to make any comments around that? Stop me if you get sick of my voice. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think mobile is future. I think it's right now. I mean, I, I don't. I, I take my phone everywhere with me. I, I get my Google Docs on it. If I'm at a meeting, I'm using my phone. Um, you know, I, I'm looking at. I'm creating things on my phone. I, I don't think that mobile is necessarily. Yeah, I, I'd say it's right now, and I don't think it's going to go away. Um, and when I look around our workplace, we've we've discovered that. For um, a board of studies meeting, for example, the cost to print the paper is the same cost as an iPad. So we have had some faculty, faculties that have made the decision to um, not print anything and give people iPads because, you know, one, it's sustainable and it's the same amount of money as it's going to cost us to actually physically print off, a num you know, the amount of paper and agendas for everybody sitting at a table. So... Yeah, I, I would. I guess I just as an opposing view is, um, yeah, mobile's already here. I think there's going to be something else. Don't know what. Views, comments on. Um, Joe again. Um, I think there's a couple of points here um, that. New Zealand and actually the developed world is behind on mobile. Mobile has um, been the first experience of the internet for most people in the developed world, uh, developing world rather. Um, they are the first time they've ever gone online has been on a what we would have called a phone, um, and that's been their first interaction and probably the only interaction they'll ever have with the internet. Um, so, so mobile is is kind of is in that space, um, and and we're kind of catching up. Um, I think the. The move to mobile, the next thing, and, and people are talking about this a lot, is that the internet will disappear. 
um, and we will be constantly connected um, and we won't ever think about having to find a Wi-Fi network or whether our 4G or 3G is connected. Um, we will just live in a state of constant and utter connection and the reality is, is that's probably actually not that far away. Oh, I'll just add to that. I mean, I did a um, contract with a area that would be called low income, which I know is where this digital literacy world sometimes hangs, but everyone, the common denominator was everyone had a phone. We, so we just did a text-based thing. That, that meant we got reach and we got, um, we got to everyone. I mean, people just weren't... This is, so this is a few years ago now, but it was, of course, mobile of horses bolted. Anything you do now would be mobile first, in my view. <coughs> So um, just to reinforce that, with, with libraries, um, our use of our public computing network is trending down, but the use of our um, Wi-Fi across libraries is trending up. Um, and so we are seeing that move to more mobile devices. And in fact, what's interesting now is, um, you know, partly the, the, the digital divide before people would come into libraries and... They were using our computers because they didn't have them at home. Um, now you can see that um, the what what we have to do is is try and help people be able to get experience with and learn how to use mobile devices where they don't have them at home. So they come in and use our computers, and um, you can tell that the people c who come in with their own devices um, have more access to the internet than the ones who are having to use our computers. So we have to look at, at what that means to how, um, how we deliver our services and maybe we should be lending devices so that we get um, that more equitably distributed and people get those skills. So Louise, I'm, I'm interested in that and, and curious about it because my, my experience going to the library and using the catalogue computers as it's still... Windows XP-ish, and it's, it's kind of, it feels, feels like an interface that's 15 years old, um, and in some ways providing Wi-Fi is a, is a simpler model, because you're, you're providing a service that people use in whatever way is comfortable for them, but you're talking about teaching people to use devices, which is getting back into the, the complexity of an, engaging with that. With this project I'm doing, I had the pleasure of meeting the National Librarian, Bill McNaught, and also the head of the Public Libraries Association of New Zealand. And I love libraries. I get invited to the Christmas party of my local library. What the <laughs> libraries are doing is so cool. I mean, just forget libraries, as you know it. Where these guys are going is they're going to be the information hubs for our community. They love my project because they can see that they're going to be serving business you know, like the 3D printers. Oh, I mean, it's so cool, the maker spaces, all these things. So I think if you haven't been around the library world, wake up, because it's just a whole different paradigm these guys are going to play with now going forward. And it's, of course, it's not about books for them anymore. They're now moving into just information, which they've always done, but, you know, it's a different model. So, you know, that you just just let them do their thing. They, they're, they're working fast and as hard as they can, but, you know, they haven't quite got there, but they certainly know that's where they're, where they're heading. Yeah. And just some good news on that front, because we, um, we have got a project at the moment to upgrade the public computing network. We know that um, it's patchy across the 55 libraries, um, so there's a lot of work on that, but also that, um, that Wi-Fi is a key part of it. And just to your point, yes, we do know that we're about connection more than we are about collection. And while we're on the library theme and mobility, um, actually maybe your library would like to be the first to le lend the internet as opposed to what New York libraries have started to do is to lend the internet with a mobile hotspot. So provided you're on some sort of course or some sort of training through the library, you get to take home the mobile hotspot, all funded, fully funded, so you're getting basically a free mobile internet connection and to me, that would be a dream. And when we tried to run it past Hutt City Libraries and thought they, they always want to be first with things in New Zealand, um, their IT manager 
looked at the cost of mobile um, data compared in New Zealand compared to the cost of mobile data in New York and said, get out of here, <laughs> don't even think about it, you know, until we fix that other problem of mobile data rates, um, Hutt City certainly weren't going to entertain uh, the idea of sort of funding the you know, internet for a period, but they're saying the cost of the mobile hotspot is less than the price of a book now as well, so it's easy to do that, it's the cost of usage which is the problem. I'm Jerome from Oakland Libraries as well. Um, I work in um, the Birkenhead Library branch, so um, my role is um, digital learning librarian. Um, to make it simple, I'm, I teach computer classes to um, those, uh, usually just basic skills class. Um, what we're finding is um, the basic skills classes, um, the attendance is dwindling what we're finding is that um, more and more um, people, especially seniors, are um, getting their own devices and they're coming to us to get trained. Um, we actually have, they'll get it from Noel Leeming, Harvey Norman, wherever, and they actually send them to us. So they trust us more than they trust themselves. Um, and another point is, um, Sometimes the infrastructure for libraries is, you know, obviously it's due to funding. We're not there because there has to be, um, not an outcry, but there has to be some point where the public says, you know, the libraries need the, this infrastructure and how do we pay for that? Um, third point, sorry to bang on. Um, and this is from the library culture part. Um, and with um, Louis, the um, digital DNA project, um, a lot of what we encounter and um, cha a challenge for us is getting our staff to that point where it's a holistic approach where they, they're as comfortable with the technology as somebody like me who, who teaches it. And once we get to that point, I think we'll be, you know, I think that's the apex for us, I think. But yeah. Does anyone else want to talk, maybe just so we can close up the, the topic of move to mobile? Sort of strayed a bit, but that's cool. No? Um, so we just thought we'd open out to the floor. We've got a small group uh, in the room today, so I'm not sure whether we want to split into groups or whether feed people over that. Um, if there's any other hot topics around digital workplace literacy that anyone would want to share, talk about, has a solution to? Lawrence? I'm wondering about the leader leadership for this is to, you know, I think someone made the good point before, if we're going to sell this into businesses, no good going and saying, have we got a good box of widgets for you? You know, what problems are we going to solve? But I think it's a bit of a chicken and egg of also needing about uh, some leadership and pe uh, and people that sort of run businesses, especially the, the big organisations. Um, you know, where, what support is it that for them? Because often they've probably got to the position, they're probably heading into the older age group if they're running the organisation, they haven't come through the digital sort of world, um, they've got where they are today without using the internet. Um, so, and if they haven't got that leadership but within a company or within a business, when the, even if the, no matter how much enthusiasm there is from the training manager, I was talking to some of the Auckland Library people um, just over, over lunch, and you know, they're being chopped, their hours in Auckland are being chopped back to be uniform because of budget constraints, and it's, so the leadership in Auckland Council, uh, I know we're not supposed to be critical around here, Mr. Red Jacket over there, um, but you know, it's clearly not got the vision that this new role of libraries and how critical they are to this digital world and bringing people along with the digital. So it worries me that our leaders, our business leaders, our, our leaders in our councils, others do not actually, they don't get it. They don't see this. It hasn't been sold to them in a way that they can say, we're going to do this and they're going to drive it. So when someone comes along and wants to cut a library, they say, that's the last thing to go. For forget, do, you know, stop 
filling the potholes in that street, put the money into the library instead. Now that's not happening in New Zealand at the moment, um, and it worries me that you know, we're trying to advance into this digital world, but without much more leadership coming from local authorities and others in their communities that you know, will keep filling the potholes, um, not actually investing in a digital future. Can I just add another solution? <laughs> the British have David Cameron has um, formed this thing called Digital Britain, and if you look at this website that I'm advocating, his name is on it. So I've put the message around that John Key, we've, the cycleways are, are fantastic, and they're done. So now it's time to get something else going. And you know, if if we can get it from the top like they have in England, it's David Cameron's personal project. He's got his name on this Digital Business Academy site. That um, it's a very positive story for the government, it's economic development, it's digital, it's everything they already like and that's why it's gone so quick in England and why they've managed to get so much money. So if you have access to people that <laughs> people that know Stephen Joyce or John Key, uh, that's particularly good. And um, But you know they, they do actually talk to each other and David Cameron's office is now talking to the New Zealand government on this thing. So it's not as far-fetched as it may sound. The British High Commissioner is talking to the New Zealand government on it. So you know we could have digital New Zealand, like, let's get digital as a campaign, just as the English are doing right now and pouring money on it and um, actually making it happen. So it's just a matter of of getting the right people. And I've heard that the order paper in government, they're running out of things to do. So we could go get in their third term, apparently. It's apparently they need some more good ideas. So here's a good one. Just in terms of, um, Joe again, um, in terms of small businesses and, and um, kind of how do we actually get small businesses to, to uptake digital skills, to get digital skills into the business, there's some real challenges for small businesses to um, hire millennials and I'd be really interested in anyone in the room who's had an experience of trying to hire a millennial and what that process has been like. Have they um, found that they've hired this person and then they, they weren't technologically savvy enough to keep them happy or they're not providing the technology skills that you know these people wanted to live as millennials and, and you know live, work the same way they live, um, which I think is a real challenge for people coming out of um, kind of schools and education systems at the moment to find jobs like that. Um, also, just while I've got the microphone, I was just reading a very interesting thing from um, from Forbes that well in the past um, CEOs were the previously this, you, know, you were the CFO and then you became the CEO. In the future, you'll be the CTO or the CIO and you'll become the, the CEO. It's um, that's how important technology is for the larger businesses. But it's um, also important to make sure that the business owners have got the digital skills and the digital understanding so that they're going to hire staff and put those pro um, policies and processes in place. So if anyone's had any experience around that, it'd be fascinating to, to hear. Anyone? <laughs> Hi there, my name's Steve. Um, we run a we're from Two Tails, and within that, we we um, me and my wife started Give a Little, which is an online and online fundraising platform, and we run a, a computer training company called Step by Step Training. So, we have a massive variety of technology in our office. We've got a we've got software developers and designers through to like administrators that sort of process um, using computers and basic sort of um, Microsoft applications. So we talk on a lady who's um, 60 and um, she is competent with technology, but the big thing for her is just a lack of confidence and a feeling of she's not able to keep up with everybody in the office. So it's more of a confidence thing. And it's more of a, just a real lack of willingness to sort of seek help herself. And I think what she doesn't realise is that she's no less capable than anyone else, but she just doesn't see the ability for her to ask Google for help rather than reaching out and pulling in most of the technical team to um, troubleshoot a pretty straightforward um, sort of query. So it's almost like a, it's a lack of sort of a, um, just a belief that the technology can actually answer the question that, that, that she has. And our younger people are just are in there solving problems, making making use of, of what's out there on the, on, the, on the net, so it's just a sort of a bit of an insight to that. <coughs> Any other hot topics? Let me share with you my, my questions. I, I, again, I don't have the answers, but 
what I perceive in this conversation and based on what I have done is that I don't think it is a problem of lack of digital skills in general. I would say, for example, millennials, going back to the point of the millennials, they are highly competent in the use of, of computer technology in general, mobile devices or, or, or laptops, or tablets. But it is, for me, the problem is about understanding what technology can do for us rather than just having access to the technology or being able to find answers on, on Google or, or wherever. So I, I think this, that, that is the, the identifying the needs and then figuring out how computer technology can assist us in addressing those needs. That's my, yeah. I agree. I think one of the biggest um, things that we need to foster is inquiry, um, innovation and agility, uh, which I guess comes down to that problem solving I was talking about. And, you know, I mean, sure, um, our students come into the university and they know how to use a device, but they actually don't know how to use a, di a device for academic pursuit. Um, you know, they, they know that they aren't necessarily um, critical thinkers yet. Um, you know, so, it, I mean, the tech, sure, they might look to technology for their answer, but they might not be able to um, figure out whether the answer is correct or not, or, you know, look at things from an academic point of view, or, you know, so, um, and, I don't know, my dad might not look at, oh, poor dad, um, might not look to Google for his first answer, but, because um, uh, he's 84, but, you know, he still, I don't think it's about age, I think it is about um, context and, uh, as I said, uh, you know, in inquiry, agility, innovation and those things, whether you've got a device or not, are the important elements, because well, I guess technology is, is useless without the people, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Um, what you were just describing, Tracy, is exactly what the service that I run, Any Questions, does with students. But we, uh, we're on track to, we've been around for 10 years now, and we're on track to, so far this year to have our third busiest year, and we're going to deal with 9,000 chats, you know. But there are 750,000 New Zealand school students, you know. Um, it's a tiny little fraction of what's out there. So, And we're at capacity with what we can offer. I mean, Auckland libraries contribute... Um, 40 shifts a week on my service. Um, they're by far the biggest contributor, but I've got libraries right around the country, but we can't grow beyond that. So librarians, we do our part through that, but um, so this is what I was saying earlier about that example I used with the, the, the program trying to develop skills of teachers, because a lot of the teachers that are out there, they haven't been shown that stuff themselves. You know, they don't necessarily feel confident in that, so we're trying to just improve their skills so then they can teach the students, so. Can I just add to that? I think, this, is that on? Yeah. yeah. Um, it's, <laughs> it's certainly an age group thing. Um, you're talking about your father, but I have uh, three boys in their 20s. They are amazingly able to do anything on a computer. They just feel very comfortable with that environment. However, they don't feel a need to learn anything until the time is right. Whereas in my upbringing, you learnt how to do this and that as part of your education but they think quite differently. So they're ready to go and take on any job, but they'll need that training then and there and they'll go with it and they'll love it. Is that just in time sort of learning? So I think um, for this in the workforce, it's the people who are employing them need to be prepared to take a lot of the younger ones, just go for it and know that they're gonna need to sort of give them some just in time training um, to upskill them with whatever it is that they need them for because everything gets, it just changes all the time. So why would they try and be experts in anything if they didn't think they were ever going to need to use it. Can, can I just answer you? I just think, uh, I think it works uh, just the same in the workplace. I mean, for us, um, some of the best stuff that happens is in the just-in-time space. Um, because I, and I guess maybe that it, I was talking a little bit about that in terms of motivation. I mean, our staff won't change their practice until they're motivated to, which is the just-in-time stuff. And actually, it's not coming to a training course about how to use X, Y, Z. It's, I've got a need. How am I going to solve it? And it's around that problem-solving moment that you've got a chance to go, hey, wow, how about this tech? And that's where I think some of the stuff you were talking about, Lawrence, it, it, it 
requires senior management push, I think, too, because if that will isn't there, then if, you know, then there isn't that, that, that moment or opportunity to go, oh, yeah, let's try to solve that maybe with a, a, a look at some alternative technologies. Um, I just want to tell Tucker that as well. I've, I've never really thought about it that way. I haven't had it express that kind of just-in-time um, training, but I'm, I'm in my 30s, and that's very much how I work, in that if I come across something new that I need to do, I just jump on YouTube, find a video, it explains it, and I go and do it. And I never ever think of you know learning to do something until I would actually need to do the thing. I mean, there's, there's learning for pleasure and reading books and all that stuff, but not in the digital space anyway. Um, and I think maybe that's a mindset change that we need to help small business owners create, is that you it's not a huge investment. You're not teaching people redundant skills that they're never going to use. You're just creating opportunity for your staff to learn new skills very cheaply, very quickly, very easily, and exactly when they need them. Um, I think that was just very, very well expressed in a way that I hadn't thought about it before. Uh, I was probably late in coming in, but uh, uh, my name's Hemi Bennett. I work for Tiarawa Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi stands for Whanau Intelligence Family Intergenerational, and we do Wi-Fi as well. But what we also do is uh, I've just opened up a community animation design coding school, CAD coding school. I deliver that at Sunset Primary School uh, and I'm teaching HTML and software. Uh, so my background in programming is uh, I wrote National Super, DPB, Unemployment Benefit. I was 16 at the time and I wrote Telecom's Cable Record System. So I've got a bit of experience in, in programming. Uh, I was probably one of the, Māori, uh, the first Māori 4GL programmers. Uh, 4GL I was writing I was magics. So uh, yeah, uh, very used to uh, delivering uh, coding and stuff like that. So I've decided that, you know, um, if you check my website out, uh, afterdarkdesignmedia.com, uh, my mission statement is to bring more Māori programmers into the world. So um, that's why I'm targeting uh, low decile uh, schools. Uh, decile 1, I think it is. So there's a lot of Māori and Pacificas in there, so just want to put that out there. Well done. Okay, um, I'd like to come back to the millennial uh, thing for just a minute. <clears throat> I don't know if you folks are aware of this, but the, the millennials are now the largest age group in the New Zealand workforce. They've actually surpassed baby boomers. All right, and that trend's continuing. They're actually going to become the majority of the workforce within the next five years. And it behooves business owners and managers to uh, figure out how this uh, generation ticks. But you know, it's not so much about the age group, but it's about the mindset. <clears throat> and, um, you know, we talk about millennials in this generalized terms about they're collaborative, you know, and they want meaningful work and sense of purpose and, uh, you know, uh, motivated and well-educated and, and all these attributes that sound great. And I go, well, you know, what? that sounds like the kind of person I want working for me, but they don't necessarily need to be in that age group. <clears throat> and so I think it's the mindset that, that we really need to, to focus on and, and uh, not get too hung up on the age stuff. Um, I just wanted to go back to the last bit before. Um, we're currently in the process of uh, going to be developing some digital literacy videos specifically aimed at um, students, um, to, you know, because that's how they learn YouTube self-directed kind of stuff. But um, we've also had discussions with people in gov.nz and stuff about other videos because that's actually a need they have identified alongside um, skills development in a wider sense, so making some different videos to, that people can share short things about how to trust information online and all that kind of stuff and how you know whether you can trust it because they're, trying to, they're struggling with the idea of trying to educate people who have never, you know, they need to know this stuff. So, yeah, I just wanted to share that. Kia ora koutou, Sarah Lee, um, Two Hats, 2020 Trust, and I'm on the Council for Internet NZ. Um, just following on that conversation, there is, we run a digital literacy challenge, and we've been taking that around the country, and it's really interesting because young people, you know, we call them digital natives, and they do, they have all this confidence and then they jump online. We, we actually have the ICDL diagnostic tests as part of the challenge. So they jump online to do this challenge and they do word processing or spreadsheets or like online essentials which has got IT security in it. And they, 
you know, they're confident to jump on there, but they don't actually know how to use these programs. And that's a concern given that, um, you know, and there's, that's probably backed up also um, by a recent survey uh, with students, which Lawrence probably knows more about, but I've got a little bit of info online here, where um, 58 secondary schools, 61,000 students participated, and they found that fewer than 6% of these students were actually able to gain a qualification that demonstrates to a prospective employer that they're job ready and equipped with ICT skills suitable to take up a job. So there's still quite a disconnect in terms of the skills that they're learning in schools and at home and being these digital natives and then that transferring to actual skills that are needed in the workplace. Yeah, the one that uh, the survey that um, Sarah is quoting from, um, Michael Barnett went public with it um, uh, as uh, in his leader of the Auckland Business Leaders Group, but also from Chamber of Commerce here in Auckland. And um, he pointed the finger at schools and basically said, "Schools, you're not giving us what we want." Um, um, I actually went back to him and said, "Look, don't load it onto schools because schools, every you know, we put all our problems on schools. They go sort it out whenever there's a new problem. Okay, they're not getting the skills in Word and Excel and the things that are useful to businesses anymore. So let schools fix it up." So um, he didn't respond um, when I went back to him, but um, to say, "Look, it's not schools' problem." Um, but there are solutions in the marketplace. There are people around. There are businesses that do this for a living. There's the ICDL program that Sarah referred to. There are there are tools around where people can get it just in time. Um, and we, we would like to see that happening with every school lever if they haven't got sort of some level of competence and using the pra the useful practical tools, not Facebook and all the social media and all the other stuff, but the stuff that a small business wants, um, that they've got the opportunity to go and um, get that. And they can get it in a it's hours or days. It's not like signing up for a seven-year PhD. Um, these, are, these can be got fairly quickly, provided they've got access to a computer, got an online access, got access to the internet, need those two things, um, then there are some really good solutions. Um, and I think what Suzanne's been talking about as well, there's even more stuff um, available in other countries. And I think we need to make sure that all our children coming out of school, don't, they won't get it at schools because they do much more exciting stuff with technology in schools than boring Microsoft packages. <laughs> um, and that's where some of the disconnect, I think, is coming. Um, so, but let's fill that gap, really. And I think universities, if we're going to university, I don't know where you have a pre-entry qualification. Say you're not coming to this institution unless you've demonstrated a level of competency in using the stuff. You probably don't. You just leave it to them, and if they fail, they fail. But um, that's their problem. Um, but I know, in other, you know Singapore is the classic one we always do, where it's been set as benchmarks now. If you don't have this level, you go to summer school before you go to a tertiary institution. If you want a job in Singapore, if you can't demonstrate a certificate of competence, um, some qualification around basic digital tools, then frankly, go get one, then come back and apply for a job. So I, I'd like to see a bit more of that top down sort of in New Zealand. I think we've heard the tui bell. So we've got about three minutes, I think, to wrap yes. up. Well, I see that you have uh, written something on the... I wrote some things that I thought were missing from our list. So I've got, um, we talked about cultural change, understanding the full potential of technology, what is technology as an enabler, leadership for digital skills. Uh, talk, someone talked about digital confidence, how do we build that across the, the nation, and this concept of just-in-time digital training. Anyone else got anything that they might want to add that helps summarise what we've discussed? Maybe I just leave you with a, a final question. I think the biggest thing that's come through for me is, you know, how do we build this leadership for digital skills in New Zealand? Who's going to hold that light? Is it, is it all of us in our communities and organisations and programmes and institutions? Who's talking about it in New Zealand? Who's not talking about it? How does that come out through NetHui? What are you going to start tweeting about, perhaps? Antonio, anything else you want, might want to add? Yeah. <clears throat> I, I have a view on this, and this is uh, absolutely open to discussion. Well, we don't have time, but 
at least I don't, just to close the, the conversation here, is that uh, I think individuals are highly capable to, to identify how technology can help them uh, solve their problems. I have seen with many people, refugees who, has just who have just learned how to use computers, and they were very capable in using specific applications or software that address their specific needs. So no two individuals were using computers in the same way. And I think we, we can translate this into the workplace. I don't think it is the lack of being able to interact with technology per se, but it is maybe the lack of understanding what technology can do for us in terms of, of uh, uh, in the workplace. Just uh, we were talking about uh, the use of technology and, and the usefulness of technology. Uh, there was one research conducted in the US where participants were asked to describe the flag of Bangladesh. And the first idea that came to their mind was Google, not the flag, because the answer was in Google. Is it bad or, or good? I don't know. But at least they know that that tool can help them to find the answer that they need. Okay, I don't know if you want to say. Noreira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Thank you.